Um, uh, I'm Anthony Johnson, the Associate Dean for Faculty Development here at the School of Law. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce um, one of our Dean uh, finalist candidates, Norman Bay. Uh, Norman holds a law degree from Harvard Law School. Um, he uh, went on from that in several different um, areas in public service, culminating in his appointment as the United States Attorney uh, for New Mexico. He followed that by uh, going to teach constitutional law and criminal law. University of New Mexico School of Law, uh, achieving tenure there, and then left there in 2009 to become the Director of Enforcement at the Federal Energy Regulatory uh, Commission. So now he's here joining us. Norman. Thank you, Anthony. Um, thank you for inviting me uh, to your law school. Uh, I really am honored uh, to be uh, one of the finalists uh, for the dean position here. I think at this point, I've been lucky enough to talk to almost everyone here um, and it's really been great. I've really enjoyed uh, meeting with everyone and hearing your views about um, what you would like to see the next team do. Uh, the topic for today's talk um, is, and this was given to me, this wasn't my uh, topic, but um, it's the University of Montana School of Law and the Future of Legal Education. So what I'd like to do in this talk essentially is to discuss um, some of the risks and some of the opportunities out there uh, for the law school. The bottom line, I think, for me, is that this is a very exciting time for this law school, despite the turmoil in the broader um, uh, marketplace for legal education. There are some significant strengths at this law school, and I think if the law school faculty and staff pull together, um, figure out what their priorities are, and what their plan is, what their vision is for the law school, some tremendous things can happen. The way a student put it to me yesterday, I think, is very interesting. The student said that, that she thought the law school was on this upward trend, uh, but that there was still more uh, success that could be achieved. So she was excited, but she also wanted to know whether or not the school was prepared, was ready to take that next step forward. And I've heard similar thoughts from a number of you. So I think it's a very exciting time for the law school. Um, one thing that I've mentioned time and again in some of my talks, and I apologize if some of you have heard this before, is that um, in 1912, uh, the bulletin of the Montana Law School noted that it wasn't enough just to teach theory. Rather, there had to be this integration of theory and practice. Montana wasn't going to be like all the other law schools in the United States. It just basically focused on theory. Rather, it wanted students who could leave this law school and have the skills um, to go out there and actually be lawyers. Um, I mean, the way this is written, even I just uh, I put this in my slides because I think it it characterizes how innovative um, this law school has been, how it has actually been a leader in legal education to the point where. Um, what the law school articulated in 1912 has become the vision for legal education in 2013. That is a significant accomplishment, right? I mean, you read now um, uh, in ALS uh, bulletins about law schools around the country trying to integrate more practice into their uh, curriculum. But, but this quote is, is so great because it's written in that kind of you know, early 20th century style. The law school graduate, even from the best schools, is very apt to be much disappointed to find on his admission to the bar that he's almost entirely unfitted and unprepared to take up the ordinary practical work of his profession. But that wasn't going to be the case for this law school. And actually, when you look at some of its early graduates, it's really quite remarkable. Uh, one of its early graduates became the dean of Duke a Law School, another became the dean at NYU Law School. Of course, uh, and I've mentioned this time again, and, and you're all aware of this, um, if you Google search terms legal education crisis, you know, you get probably dozens of articles talking about it. The latest dismal news uh, came out in August, uh, so just uh, about two months ago. Again, with the caption, law school applications declining sharply, showing the multi-year trend. I, saying uh, at my presentation to the students that it looks like uh, the slope of a black diamond um, you know, uh, ski uh, resort. Uh, but the law school applications have continued to plummet, and enrollment has gone down too, as law schools have worried about admitting students 
um, who would dilute um, their LSAT scores and their GPAs alike. Um, and so basically now um, the number of applications is down 30% uh, from 2010. Um, and um, law schools as a whole in the aggregate um, are seeing a drop um, in, applica in applicants uh, to the point where um, you have levels last seen 30 years ago. That is really amazing, but not in a good kind of way. Um, the punchline for me is that while legal education may be in a state of crisis, I think it is in a state of crisis, not all schools are um, uh, situated similarly. Um, and some schools, I think, uh, will survive this just fine. The schools, uh, the top 10 schools will always be doing well, and the like may be top 20. Um, schools in the fourth tier that are private, that charge exorbitant amounts for tuition, um, they're going to suffer, and other schools will have an opportunity to keep progressing. Um, and I think that this law school has that opportunity if it seizes the opportunity. And here is a quote from Darwin, which I thought was really interesting, um, in which Darwin says, it's not the strongest or the most intelligent who survive, but those who can best manage change. And there's a lot of change, obviously, happening in legal education now. So what I'd like to do um, is to start this conversation um, about um, things that the law school could be considering doing under a new dean. Um, and, um, I really have a number of caveats here that I want to lay out on the table. First, um, all of these thoughts on my part, um, I offer a, with a great deal of humility. And I say that because each of you knows this law school far better than I do, right? Um, I'm, I'm an outsider. Um, I've read everything I can. I've talked to a number of you. I've talked to students. But I'm still an outsider, right? I don't have this law school in my bones in the way um, that you do. Um, the other thing is, a lot of what I'm, I'm going to present to you is based upon materials that you yourself have put together in the past. Um, the strategic plan, for example, uh, from uh, for 2009 to 2014 uh, gave me some ideas, as did the self-study. Uh, one thing that really impressed me, by the way, about your 2010 self-study is that it showed that the faculty here has been um, actively uh, engage in a process of critical self-examination. Um, a lot of questions have been asked by the faculty over the year, years. I don't know that the faculty has answered the questions, but at least it's asking, I think, the right questions. So that's, that's a good starting point. Uh, what this means, because a lot of uh, the thoughts I have are, have been culled from your materials, is that most of my ideas, frankly, are not new ideas, right? Uh, I have few. Uh, but not certainly not all of them. Um, and the other uh, caveat I have is that under a model of shared governance, right, um, the question is what you want to do and how I can facilitate what you want to do, which is why I describe this as starting a conversation, because I think that's what your dean is going to have to do. Um, your dean is going to have to bring everybody together, start this conversation, and see if the faculty um, can share the same vision um, and the same um, goals um, in terms of what you want the law school to do, and how you want to do it. Okay, so just so basically, um, I'm trying to join that conversation and to tee up some ideas for you. I think when you're doing a strategic thinking, um, there are a number of questions you have to ask. Uh, first, um, what are the risks? Um, what are the opportunities? What are your priorities? And what's the goal, right? Um, and I assume there um, that the goal um, is excellence in the classroom, scholarship, and service, and perhaps even, the way I put it, is to achieve best-in-class status um, as a law school. Um, obviously, uh, the in-class part is important, uh, because I think that um, this law school um, uh, could compare itself, not to law schools or, you know, throughout the United States, but certainly in the Rockies and, the, and in the Pacific Northwest uh, and in the West, too. Okay. Um, the way I thought about this um, is um, survive and thrive. And I didn't realize, actually, at the time I wrote this, that thrive 
is now kind of the uh, what uh, the, uh, the the marketing uh, label that the university is using, um, and so that's really I think something that the law school could do that is not only survive the present uh, crisis, uh, but then thrive as well. And the reason why I say that is I think that you have some unique strengths, and, and you're all aware of these strengths. You've got um, you've got a good faculty, right? You've got a strong faculty. You have a tradition of dedication to the classroom. You have this innovative uh, curriculum um, that focuses not only on theory, but on practice, and it has mandatory clinic. Again, um, uh, Montana started doing something 100 years ago that no one else was doing, right? You have one of the top value law schools in the country. Uh, when you compare um, the tuition of this law school against other regional law schools, whether it's Denver University, Will Yamit, um, you know, Lewis and Clark, uh, Gonzaga, um, you are so much cheaper. You are so much cheaper. At least $10,000 a year cheaper in some instances, um, and up to $15,000 in others. Right? You have state-of-the-art facilities. Um, historically, you have had, a, have had a strong relationship with the bench and bar. Um, you have a tradition of service to the state. And of course, you have this amazing location. For anyone who enjoys the outdoors, right, uh, this is Nirvana. It does not get any better than this. Um, and I actually think that that is a very, very powerful marketing tool when you put all of that together. Right? That is a great package. Um, and so that's going to lead to some other comments I have about the need to do more marketing. Um, I think that one very intriguing statistic, and it, and it remains to be seen whether it continues this year or not, um, is that in this past year, um, this law school was one of half a dozen or so in the country, uh, in the country, to see an increase in the number of applications. That's really kind of amazing. Um, it's received recognition for its innovation in the classroom, and it jumped more than 30 places in the US News and World Report rankings. And again, um, like um, uh, everyone else in the legal academy, you know, I don't want to get hung up on that, but the fact of the matter is that it happened, and it happened in a way that directionally is quite positive for this law school. And while professors might not like it, applicants look at things like that. Um, so that, that's great. In fact, when you compare this law school's ranking to other regional schools, I think there's only one other school that's at the same place, and that's Wyoming. Um, and of course, this school can be a lot better than my own, right? <laughs> I mean, come on, right? Okay. Um, so, what I thought I would do to share some thoughts with you based on my brainstorming um, uh, and based on my conversations with a number of you is to provide you with a menu of options. Um, and um, the, the options really vary in terms of the amount of change required of the faculty, right? So. The first set of options, which I'll, which I'll get to in a little bit, require very little of the faculty. Um, and then option two requires a little bit more. Option three requires even more. Um, so maybe that's a way of thinking about how you want to stage any possible changes to what you're doing here. You can go for the low-hanging fruit, and maybe you can pick off some of the other stuff that might require uh, greater effort in terms of reaching a consensus, as well as additional resources, OK? But why do I put this slide up there talking about why change is hard? Um, I put it up there because I think it's important for everyone to recognize um, that this is going to require a lot of effort by the faculty. Um, it can't just be the dean who tries to do this, right? The dean can start the conversation, but it's got to be the faculty deciding whether or not it wants to do this, OK? Um, so when, when I talk about change, you always have to ask the first question, do the benefits outweigh the cost? Because every change you make has a cost. There is going to be some person, some stakeholder somewhere who does not necessarily like that change. I mean, I, I think the only exception, this was pointed out to me in a conference once, was if someone said to you, hey, um, I could give you a lottery ticket where you would win $10 million. Do you want the ticket? Yeah, okay, everyone raised their hand. Yes, of course I would want the ticket. Right? Well, that's easy, but there are very few $10 million lottery tickets out there. This is much harder than that. Um, so do the benefits outweigh the cost. Um, do the stakeholders understand the reason for the change? Um, critically, has there been good communication and outreach? Is there that relationship of trust among the faculty and with the faculty and the dean? 
Um, do you have buy-in, right? Because it can't be a case where the dean is charging up the hill and looks around and, <laughs> hey, where is everybody? <laughs> How are we going to take this hill? It obviously can't be that, right? Because change will fail then. Um, and then, of course, even if the faculty comes up with a consensus, um, there has to be a plan for implementation. And my, my caveat, the final caveat is um, something I picked up from this really good book. It's one of the best books I've read in years called Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. Has anyone read that by Daniel Kahneman? So he's a Nobel Prize winning economist. The amazing thing about Kahneman is he's not an economist. He's a psychologist. Um, and so he basically has attacked the notion that people are purely rational actors, which is oftentimes posited in economics. So he talks about different flaws in thinking. Um, and one of the flaws he describes he, uh, is cognitive uh, bias. And one of the cognitive biases he describes is planning fallacy. Um, maybe some of you have been subjected to that in the past. But it's the fallacy where you get a group of people together. They get really excited about an idea. And then they say, oh, this will be easy to implement. Right? We'll get this done in one semester, right? <laughs> or something like that. Three years later, <laughs> people are wondering why the project hasn't gotten off the ground, right? In fact, Kahneman's uh, example of planning fallacy um, is that they were going to revise a textbook in Israel uh, where he was working at the time. And this was going to be a big change by the Ministry of Education. People thought it could be done in a year. For a variety of reasons, it took six years. Okay. So it's always important to remember that we think change is easy, it's not. Right? And actually, the one antidote he prescribes, which is wonderful, is he says, to combat planning fallacy, have everyone kind of sit around a table and ask the question. So now it's three years after the fact. The project still hasn't been completed. What went wrong? and have each person write on a piece of paper where they think things went wrong, right? Um, and um, that brainstorming session oftentimes will allow you to identify uh, key assumptions and potential problems that might later come back to haunt the project. So anyway, so this is just something to keep in mind as the faculty starts planning um, what it wants to do next. Okay, easy option, stay the course, right? Let's stay the course. Um, here, I think um, the focus would be the basics, right? Continuing to improve in the classroom, scholarship and service, figuring out where uh, fixes need to be made, for example, the clinic. Um, if another Indian law professor is needed, um, I would put it right up there, right? In this option one, stay the course, make sure that the programs that are in place have the resources they need, and keep going from there. Um, in this package as well, marketing. Right? Um, I think that uh, the law school has not necessarily um, uh, relied upon social media as much as it could, particularly so since uh, millennials, um, they do rely on stuff, right? Um, the website, I think, could have more pizzazz. And I, every time I mention that, everyone kind of nods their head, and I know it can be difficult to get this done, but I think there are resources um, at the U that could help the law school do this, including capping the School for Visual Arts, right? Let some student there do it as a semester-long project for a grade. And, and you probably get this amazing product. Um, Twitter, so may, maybe someone, I don't know who, maybe just the dean, uh, should set up a, a Twitter account. Um, obviously, you wouldn't describe what a wonderful lunch you had, but you would describe the many successes at the law school, right? With photographs from time to time, that kind of thing. Maybe Facebook. Um, Facebook, I think, actually has a lot of potential. Um, I have to admit, uh, being the dinosaur that I am, that I do not use Facebook. <laughs> I'm probably like the only person in this classroom not to. Oh, good, Mainland, thank you for shaking your head and uh, saying that you don't do it either. Um, but, you know, um, um, the students here do, and applicants do as well. And, and it has the potential to create a photo album um, where uh, you could upload pictures uh, uh, of the students to kind of, uh, or to try to capture um, the unique, vibrant community that's here, right? Um, you might even consider, I don't know if you can do this on Facebook, certainly you could do it on the website, um, uploading video links, 
right? We have interviews of students and the like, but doing it in a way that is very high quality, where there are good production values, um, as opposed to something that looks like the government made it, you know, some, you know, GS8 somewhere kind of made it on a, uh, uh, on some faulty equipment. Um, so uh, another kind of option under, um, another point under option one, recruitment, right? Um, uh, emphasizing a recruitment um, of students. Um, there is, I think, a lot of potential impact here um, that could affect the way in which this law school is viewed generally. Um, the numbers for the law school, and I would never want to get hung up on this because I think, I think it's dangerous to become obsessed with U.S. News and World Report rankings, but um, if you're doing things that make the law school better, and if as a byproduct of that, the rankings go up, I don't think that's a problem. I do think it's a problem if you start trying to gain the system and that becomes your driver. But um, because there are only 83 students per class, small movements in the number of students who attend could, I, I, my theory is, could fairly dramatically um, impact um, the numbers for this law school. Um, I think uh, the median is like 156, 157, somewhere around there for the LSAT. So with you know 83 students, I mean, if you just had three or four, five or six uh, that were somewhere up there, suddenly maybe you're up to the high 150s. Um, and um, and so how might you get those um, better students? By the way, I should also say that it, in in terms of talking about that, the focus always has to be on will it improve the classroom, right, to have um, students uh, who are uh, really smart. I, I think, and again, there's not necessarily always this correlation between uh, LSAT and, and uh, the way in which students uh, perform in the classroom, but um, in general, I think it is better to have really bright students at a, at a law school because they help spark the classroom discussions, they help motivate their classmates, they help in so many ways, right? If you can call on that one student who is always prepared, always has the right answer, you know that there is much less of a chance that the, the class is gonna get derailed by some sort of, you know, very well-meaning, but uh, perhaps mistaken student. So, anyways, I do think that there's pedagogic value um, in, 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 for example, keeping the best and brightest Montanans. Um, uh, the yield um, um, indicates that uh, some uh, Montanans are lost uh, who would add value to this law school. In some instances, you might lose students um, who are headed off uh, to a school where they basically could never be persuaded uh, to come to Montana. But I think there is a lot of room there for recruiting students who want to stay in a state. Um, and know that they want to practice either in Montana or want to practice regionally. Um, so, so keeping the best and brightest Montanans, um, adding a few more non-residents. The goal in the self-study uh, was 25. Um, that number has dipped in recent classes. It's around 17 or 18. Uh, the impact there um, is that um, the university benefits because they keep a lot of that tuition money. Um, at some point, uh, that could come back to haunt the law school if there's still this shortfall in the targeted number of um, non-residents who attend. Uh, under this option one, I would put strengthening ties with the bench and bar based on comments that I've heard uh, both here at the law school and in meeting with members of the bench and bar. There could be some strengthening that, that, has, to, that has to occur. Um, on fundraising, um, I think that should be part of this option one. Clearly, it is uh, uh, very important to the law school. Uh, the caveat being that large gifts will take time uh, to be realized, if they're realized at all. Um, and that, you know, obviously, uh, you do the best that you, you can as a dean, but, but uh, uh, you know, it depends upon the donor uh, to make the, uh, the gift. But, um, and obviously, we, we get this fundraising. If it happens, uh, we could go to scholarships, uh, faculty and staff pay, um, and, and kind of the holy grail uh, from my perspective would be endowed chairs. I mean, I think it would be great if the law school could end up with 
two or three endowed shares. Uh, so kind of a big aspiration of. Okay, modest change. So the first set of options, I think, actually would not require that much from the law school faculty, right? It, a lot of that stuff, I think, I would view as relatively low-hanging fruit. Um, these are the kinds of things that would require more discussion because um, they involve some changes to the curriculum. One, and so you can maybe think about this set of change, or potential change, as being thematic in nature, right? Um, the first theme would be economic development. Are there things that the law school could do to help spur economic development in the state of Montana, right? Um, a, it'd be great for our students if, if the law school could do that because they could get jobs um, in those areas. Uh, second, it's great for the state if there's this economic development. Third, it's great uh, for the university. And of course, um, it would sell um, in the state capital. They love the fact that the law school has, as part of its mission, trying to do what it can to foster economic development. But this requires a shift in the way in which one thinks about the law school and its mission. I mean, obviously, this is not the mission, but it would be part of the mission. So how might the school, if it decides to go in that area, think about areas where it could help foster economic development? Um, I think um, one that quickly comes to mind is energy law, um, oil and gas law, and perhaps a clinic that involves some combination of those things. Um, why do I say oil and gas law? Well, because there's the Bakken Shale, right? That straddles both um, Montana um, and North Dakota, though most of it, or much of it, is in North Dakota. But, uh, but there is a boom out there, right? Um, and that means that there is a need for lawyers who have the skill set um, to handle that kind of work. With respect to energy law, my thinking was that one of the uh, really growing areas of the law right now is energy law, um, both uh, in the practice world and in academia. Uh, people are realizing that energy law is not quite natural resources law, um, but it's also uh, not quite environmental law, uh, but that it has strong connections to both, right? Um, and that it can help foster economic development. Uh, particularly in a state like Montana, which has great wind resources. Um, in fact, it's one of the uh, what richest states in the, in, the, in the United States with respect to wind uh, resources. So maybe there is the possibility that if you combined energy law to the package that the law school already offers with respect to environmental law and natural resources law, that, could, that it could enrich um, um, the program that the law school has already put together. Another possibility, intellectual property. So there was the large software uh, company um, in Bozeman. It was sold to Oracle. Uh, but in meeting with Provost Brown the other day, he noted that he has been meeting um, any number of high-tech startups um, or uh, representatives from these high-tech startups over the last few weeks. I think more of them are out there, perhaps, um, than most of us realize. To me, it makes sense because if you are a high-tech uh, startup, you know, you could be in Silicon Valley, it could be in Portland, you could be in Seattle, perhaps Boulder, but why not Missoula, right? Um, because you've got lots of broadband access here, right? You've got the bandwidth, um, you've got this amazing location, um, it's cheaper to be here, right? Um, and so maybe the law school could help provide uh, the lawyers um, for those startups, okay? Some of which you hope, you know, get a big time. We're from the, the grateful <laughs> alumnus, <laughs> alumni of the school, uh, writes out a big check uh, to, to the law school. Um, okay, um, another possibility, a small business entrepreneurship clinic, um, and this would partner uh, with the school of business. On my tour uh, this morning around the University of Montana, we went into the business school, and I was told that there is a, basically an entrepreneurship clinic there that helps uh, uh, small businesses in Montana put together a business plan. It seems to me that there's a great opportunity to partner uh, with the business school so that they put together some of the business analysts and the law school provides a law student who can do some of the basic legal work, right? 
And so that law student is going to develop some terrific skills with respect to um, negotiations, contract drafting, all of that. Um, and, um, and, and, uh, and so that uh, might be something where there are some real benefits to the law school, lots of small businesses in the state, um, to the university. Uh, and so that's another idea I had. The other nice thing about this uh, thought is that the law school has a lot of um, expertise um, in the area of small business uh, and, and tax law. And there are a lot of transactional lawyers at the law school, um, and there are a lot of tax lawyers. Okay, um, another thought, international law. Uh, the main campus of uh, the university has a global leadership initiative. Uh, it's a pretty ambitious uh, program. The hope is that 70% of the students have some sort of uh, substantive uh, international experience. Um, the law school really is not part of that. Um, and so maybe it should be. Uh, maybe it will help the students uh, become uh, better lawyers in the 21st century, or maybe it will help them um, basically uh, um, what, assist in economic development in the state. Why do I say the latter? Uh, it turns out that um, a year or two ago, um, Montana um, had a record um, amount of exports to other countries. It was like $1.3 billion worth of exports. The five leading countries were Canada, Mexico, um, maybe not surprising since they're part of NAFTA, um, but uh, China, uh, Korea, and Japan, right? And of course, the Mike Mansfield Center um, is, uh, was founded to develop relationships uh, with Asia. So maybe there's an opportunity to partner with the Mansfield Center um, and uh, to focus on international uh, public law, but also international transactional law. So it's, again, it's just something to think about. Uh, but right now, there is, there is a hole, I think, in the curriculum with respect to international course offerings. Um, so this one, by the way, originally when I drafted this, I put under economic development. Uh, and so I think you could make that argument as well. In terms of other possible programs, maybe a semester in DC. Uh, John Mudd was telling me that a lot of alumni of this school practice in Washington, DC. I think it could be a terrific experience uh, for the students here. And of course, uh, Montana as a whole, um, as always, uh, um, exercise just a huge amount of, uh, of influence um, in Washington, D.C., uh, both as a school and as a state. I think Montana has punched above its weight. Uh, you know, there have been so many uh, significant national leaders to come out of Montana. Um, and a semester of D.C., I think, I could be consistent uh, with that theme. Um, study abroad opportunities, so this would be part of the uh, international law thinking. Okay, so um, I described these as involving modest change. That was probably an understatement. I think it's actually more than modest, but it's, it's certainly not, um, it does not require, it requires a lot more change than the first set of options. Are everyone ready for option three? Okay, <laughs> <laughs> seat belts on. Okay. No, no, head, head's exploding, not allowed. Okay. Okay. So, um, this involves a much greater amount of change. Uh, and so there, there would have to be yeah, hysterical laughter, right? So uh, coming from the audience. And so there would have to be, um, I think, a, a, a really good conversation among the faculty about whether there was any interest in doing any of this, whether the cost of doing this um, um, outweighed the benefits or the benefits outweighed the cost. Um, and, this question, the first bullet, I got from the 2009-2004 uh, strategic plan and self-study. That is, um, has the law school achieved the proper balance between required and elective classes, right? Because right now, if you're a law student, um, you have so many required classes, it really makes it very difficult to take electives. It also makes it difficult to get your certificate, whether it's in mediation, um, Indian law, um, or natural resources uh, and environmental law. So that's, that's a big question. You know, it's interesting when I spoke at, uh, with members of the bench and bar, um, Bob Phillips said that his recollection was that the law school had so many required classes because back in the day, you could practice law in Montana if you got a diploma from this law school, so you didn't have to take the bar. 
Um, and so he said, you know, his recollection was that the law school put in all these required classes to ensure that its graduates could cover the basics once they got out of, 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 of uh, the law school. But of course now, that is no longer a possibility, right? You, you can't just graduate from here and then practice law. So since the rationale that led to the imposition uh, of all the required classes no longer exists, should there still be all these required classes? I don't know the answer to that, right? And um, it would be interesting, however, to have that conversation with the faculty. Um, the difficulty about teeing up something like this based on my time on a faculty is that, as I said in an earlier slide, change is hard, right? I mean, <laughs> pe people think about something like that, or it can be a very instinctive reaction. What, what do you mean, get rid of my required class? Are you saying my class is not as important as I think it is? You know, no, that can be a very human reaction, and you have to honor that. You have to respect that. Um, but so that's that's one issue. Um, second, um, the size of the required classes. So let's say most of the well, the required classes remain, or, or many of them, and surely there would have to be at least some, right? Um, but um, I was actually struck by the fact that for many of the required classes, not all of them, but for many of them, um, the full class. Uh, sits in on the class, so all 83 students, right? Um, I actually don't think that's necessarily a good thing. Uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, research showing that uh, teaching outcomes can be tied to the size of the class. And so, at least for myself, I always thought it was much easier to teach a class of around 40 students than around 70 students. It, just, it was just materially easier. And certainly in terms of knowing the students and working with them as individuals, it was much easier when I had around 40 than when I had 70 plus, right? At least for me, once I get over about 50, it's even harder for me to memorize all their names, right? So it becomes a little bit more impersonal. So I teed out. Um, new hires, right? Um, I'm, this is obviously a truism that each faculty line is precious, but it is. Um, there's not the likelihood that new faculty lines will be coming to the law school anytime soon. So how do you want to use each one of those precious faculty lines? The easiest way, uh, in a way that avoids any kind of hard discussion among the faculty, is to say, well, if this person taught this set of courses, that's what the new person should teach. Right? That's easy, because you don't have to confront change. Right? You maintain the status quo. Um, but strategically, is that what the law school wants to do? Or are there opportunities, right, because you have to think about the risks, and I think the law school actually is pretty well positioned to deal with the risks, but what are the opportunities out there for the law school, right? Um, and if you can identify those areas, do you start thinking about maybe tweaking what this new faculty line um, um, covers, right? Here's another thought. Um, instead of having fewer certificate programs uh, uh, or making it harder for students uh, to get certificates, what about increasing the number of certificate programs, right? Because um, right now uh, we, uh, there are three certificate programs, but there are areas of law where there are a lot of faculty who teach those courses and who are great at teaching those classes, uh, those courses. Um, so you have um, business and tax. Right, so for the student who knows that she wants to specialize in business and tax, why not let her get that certificate in business and tax? Right, uh, might be useful to that student when she looks for a job. Okay, um, and again, when I say new certificate programs, um, I should uh, footnote that by saying that for the student who doesn't want a certificate but wants a general background, let the student do that. I mean, you don't have to get a certificate. It's only if you want to get a certificate. Another possibility, trial and appellate advocacy, right? Um, the school has a wealth of professors who actually can teach those courses and do a great job teaching those courses. Um, and the school is so fortunate in that regard because in hiring faculty, a practice, having some practice background has been important to the school, which means that it has a bandwidth to teach these courses, teach them well, and offer a certificate. Right? So maybe that would be useful um, to some graduates of this law school. And as a subset of that, maybe even criminal law. Uh, uh, 
uh, I was told uh, that uh, because there's so many counties uh, in Montana, there are like more than 50 DAs in the state. And for some of the smaller counties, some of those DAs are very recent graduates of this law school. Um, so maybe, um, you know, a criminal law certificate makes sense. I don't think, by the way, that for those three new certificate programs, if you have to hire any additional faculty, you probably can staff that up with the faculty you already have. Now, what are the advantages? First, um, it might be good for the students if they have a desire to specialize in one of these areas. Um, second, it might help the students get jobs. Third, I think it's consistent with the mission uh, or vision of a law school that it wants to blend both theory and practice and graduate students who can practice law the day they leave this law school. And finally, um, I think that um, it's also great marketing, perhaps, right? Uh, because now you can say, look, not only do we have um, these other certificates, but we have these certificates as well. Um, if you want to leave law school um, with real depth um, in certain areas, um, you can do it here, right? Uh, but that requires, again, and so I'm just teeing up the conversation, right? So I, uh, I certainly would not have what, uh, I would be presumptuous uh, to think that I know what the answers are because I don't. Uh, this is simply kind of my combing through everything, talking to a number of you, and, and teeing up some ideas for you. And I, what, I, what I hope you also take from this um, is um, that's um, how I would um, act as a dean. Right? I and mean, that's kind of what my approach would be as a dean, um, to try to be very thoughtful about things, uh, but to initiate conversations, uh, to pre present ideas to you, um, and then you tell me what you want to do. Right? Um, and if you tell me you want to do some of these, then we figure out how we do them. Right? We, we figure out the plan, um, and then we implement. Uh, but the process in all of this with respect to change is very, very important. I think as important as the idea of is the process that you use to make sure that people know what you want to do and why you want to do it um, so as to achieve buy-in, right? Because unless there's that buy-in, it's doomed to fail. Um, it won't go anywhere, and it shouldn't. Okay, so that's all I've got in terms of my prepared remarks. So if you have questions for me, I'm happy um, to take them. Unfortunately, um, I understand this is canned immunity week, and I gave up my can earlier uh, today. <laughs> so I, I, am, uh, I am defenseless, but otherwise I'm available <laughs> to take your questions. So, oh, sure. Um, Anthony. In, in thinking about some of these areas, and, and if, if you come in, what, how should we um, assess in terms of the changes um, you know, where we are or can be successful? And what kind of self-assessment as a, as a faculty in a school that, or would you have us do to know, um, okay, this is where we're ready to go? Um, so it's not just a conversation about kind of what we, we want to do, but what we're able to do um, with the yeah. team we have and the strengths we have. Yeah, no, I mean, obviously that's important. To do any kind of strategic planning, you have to figure out what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are. Uh, some of these options, frankly, would require new hires for, or, or um, unless uh, someone on the faculty wanted to get into that area, right? Uh, but for example, intellectual property is, is a fairly uh, weedy area of the law, so you probably have to make a hire to do that. So maybe that's off the table, right? Maybe that's aspirational. Like, we'd love to do that, but that one's going to have to wait for a while. But so what you would do is you'd figure out where uh, you have the resources and where you have the commitment on the part of the faculty who would be asked to carry out uh, the initiative, right? Um, and then you have this discussion with the broader faculty once you know that you have the wherewithal to get the job done, um, and you start the conversation. But, I, but that's an important question, right? Because it, it doesn't do any, you any good to come up with ideas if you don't have the ability you know, to, to implement, to execute the plan. Uh, 
and it's always important to think about where things can go off the rails, which is you know, why you want to avoid planning panels. Oh, sure, this is going to be easy. We'll just get these three professors to teach us, and it'll work out just fine. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, yeah, Barry? So I think a lot of the things you've raised strike me as things we thought about or things we that suit us. I agree with you, for example, that we have an incredible um, depth and quality of faculty in business and tax and trial and appellate advocacy and criminal law. The required class balance is something we thought about over the years, required elective. Right. Um, but partly, maybe, to think about what should be required and what should be elective, we need to know or think about what people graduating need to be able to know and do. Sure to be able to enter practice mm -hmm. pretty well prepared. So you've done all sorts of, you have an interesting law background in terms of what you've done. Can you talk a little bit about what you think a new lawyer would need to be able to do upon graduation? And would that inform how you decided what would be re required or elective? Well, I don't think it should be my views alone. I mean, that's, that's the kind of, a judgment uh, that should involve the entire faculty. I, th I think it should involve the bench and the bar as well. Um, but certainly all, all the basics, I would think, still apply today, uh, just as they did when each of us graduated from law school. That is the ability to do um, analytical uh, reasoning, you know, like critical thinking, thinking like a lawyer, having the ability to write, to write well, uh, perhaps draft uh, legal agreements, um, all, all of that, I think, to do with advocacy. I think all those are basic skill sets. Uh, I don't. I don't think that has changed um, since the time I, I graduated from law school. Certainly, in the kind of uh, more recent graduates from law school that I work with, uh, you know, I, I still think they have to have those basic uh, skill sets. So, but but I don't know if any of you think uh, that there. Uh, are other things that we should add to the, the traditional skills uh, or practice skills that that uh, law schools have emphasized? I don't know. Yeah, Hillary. Um, this is kind of along the lines of your question or your discussion about how you would sit down in a brainstorming session and have people say it's three years out, what went wrong, but right. I won't make you do that on the fly. Right. Um, so it's a twist on right. that. <laughs> sure. Uh, where don't you want to be in five years? <laughs> oh, you mean if I were the dean here? Oh, that, that, that I think is fairly easy, right? Um, I think it would be a great loss uh, for this law school uh, to be at a place five years from now, no farther along than it is now. Right, with the faculty still in their heart wanting there to be progress, but paralyzed, right, uh, with inaction, right, kind of paralysis by analysis. <laughs> I think that I think there would be a missed opportunity there. I do think that there's an opportunity. I think some fourth-tier private law schools are going to fold. Um, I think um, it's like that Darwin quote. You know, the schools that adapt to the change that's happening in the marketplace are the ones most likely to thrive. So yeah, you know, I think if a dean came in here and you found yourself, you know, in the same place uh, five years from now that you are now, where, where you are now, I think that would be a, a terrible lost opportunity, right? So, because there is some easy or low-hanging fruit here, right? And so I, and, and it doesn't really require a lot. Uh, it just as you get you know, in, into these other areas, and options two and three, that, that there has to be, I think, uh, a, a much deeper kind of conversation. But yeah, don't you think that would be a terrible loss if, if you'd almost feel like, gosh, why did we go through this, you know, this surge, which is just incredibly time intensive for you, only to find ourselves in the same place we were in, you know, five years ago. Um, and I have to say, speaking for myself, that I've always thought that um, you should leave a place in better shape than when you found it. And so I, I think I, uh, you know, uh, if I were in that situation and in a place that I had been 
WIMP uh, had not in any way uh, advanced, um, it'd be very sad. It really would. It'd be sad. It'd be sad. I think for your team. I think it'd be sad for you. Mm -hmm. So I want to pick up on your your comment about paralysis <laughs> by analysis. Um, when you prompt this to the the possibility of seeing option three, um, I like others probably thought, well, you know, maybe it will blow my head off. But <laughs> I, I will say I will say to you that every one of the questions, pretty much that you've identified, were you know. The, are things that we've talked about right, right. forever. Right. And so, right. so I mean, what we do is it's not lack of creativity right. and not, and not yeah. asking the hard right. questions and saying, well, can't we do? Right. It is this paralysis by analysis. Right. It's convening the committee that reports to a larger group who then will report to the faculty, <laughs> and then four years later, something right. trickles out, it comes to the faculty, and on a close vote, a lot of questions <laughs> are raised, and nothing is done. Right. And I mean, I mean, we are the epitome of the group that six years later looks back and says, well, why in the hell couldn't we have accomplished some of that stuff? Right? And I like your notion. Yeah. Put in the planning process, you know, right. you know, certain well, comes three years from now, what what could what could derail right. all of this right. intensity? I right. mean, we got the intensity. Right. We know right. what we want to do. Right. We've asked the right questions, and then it just it, but when you look at our program, you right. can see that we've accomplished a lot, but we no, haven't fine. accomplished nearly what we can do. Right. And so my question to you is yeah. breaking the glass, right. breaking the glass of uh, paralysis through analysis. I mean, right. you know, you can be the, the uh, facilitator for change, and we can change if you can help us break through that glass. Right. Um, that's such a great question. Uh, or statement, I don't know which. <laughs> but you know, as I read um, the self-study from 2009-2010, this is an impressive document. It is. I don't know if you were part of the group that, that authored yeah, it. Yeah, I, I, you know, you but, know, I'm not going to take any right. credit okay. for it, but, right. but yeah, the, the faculty right. has produced a right. lot of good documents. We have all of the skills, the lawyer skills, to create yeah. very fine yeah. documents. And, and, and to ask the hard questions, because that's what people were doing in this. And right. then, you know, page after page, there'd be a section which says, well, but here at the law school, we're kind of hung up on this or that. Right? But we know that this is an issue, and we're going to try to work on it. Uh, and um, so people have been asking the right questions, which is why you know, one of my caveats initially was, look, I'm not going to tell you anything you haven't heard before and you haven't thought about. Right? So I'm just kind of telling you things that um, um, kind of really kind of jump out at me uh, based upon things that I've heard and things that I've read that you yourselves have seen. Right? Or you look at the strategic plan. I mean, there, there's all kinds of stuff in here, right? All kinds of hard questions that are teed up. Um, so how, how can the faculty move forward recognizing that everyone shares the same goal that is making this law school the best law school it can be for its students, right? Really providing outstanding legal education to the students. To a large extent, you've already done that. But, but you know, what more can be done? Um, and so everyone seems to share the same broad goal, but the hard thing is that the devil's in the details, right? So how do you, how do you accomplish this? One thought I have based on what you said is that the process seems to be flawed, right? It sounds like stuff is almost literally dying in committee. And, and in fairness to the faculty on those committees, it's not easy, because the more contentious the issue, you know, the more back and forth within that committee. Um, and then, of course, as faculty members uh, with the, the course loads that you have, you know, it, it is really hard to schedule meetings. It's hard for people to meet. Uh, it's hard for them to find, carve out space to have these kinds of thoughtful discussions. And before you know it, you have to write your final exam for the semester, 
You know, I mean, this, this is not easy stuff. So maybe, maybe the way of helping the faculty get there is to think about the process. Maybe the process has to be streamlined. Um, so that you said the two committees review something. Well, I don't know. It's it, maybe not maybe not that, but it. it <laughs> I think that we have uh, the depth of the committee around. Here. Yeah. I mean, and as a con and as a consequence, when you're talking about right. low hanging fruit. Right. We'll we'll see ripe fruit. Fall, late in the fall, spoiling <laughs> still on the vine because nobody has been able to go like this and pull it down. You know, one person is right there and two people pulling them back. <laughs> you know, but, okay, so some of the logging through the option one, frankly, the dean and staff can yeah, right. do, you know, assuming the faculty consents to it, right? Uh, you know, the, Facebook page and Twitter, the kind of social media outreach. Um, but certainly some of these other things involve a lot more discussion. So may maybe the process has to be streamlined, you know. Um, and you create a special committee. I'm not a huge fan of creating <laughs> committees, but maybe that's what you need, you know. And you bring in faculty who want to serve on it with the understanding um, that there needs to be some sort of recommendation to the full faculty by the end of the semester. You know, maybe that's what you do. Because otherwise, you're right. I mean, if that's the, the track record, then, then clearly something has to be done to tweak the process. So that would be my suggestion. You know, one more, one more yep. question. Oh. Well, it's a question or a comment. Um, my observation as a relatively new faculty mm -hmm. member of this phenomena is maybe some confusion or blurring around, around this shared governance model mm -hmm. of what truly should be or is best carried out by the administration, and what is best mm -hmm. sent to a committee. Right. And so maybe that's part of the process, and maybe a comment from you. Have you seen that? I know you've been in, in the mm -hmm. academy. Have you seen that? And is that a particular barrier to us, the shared governance model, in moving some of these forward? No, I, I think the shared governance model is the one that just about every law school uses. I, and when you're talking about uh, potential changes to the curriculum. I, I don't know of a law school anywhere that wouldn't send it through the committee and then take it to the full faculty that makes it out of the committee. Um, but, but this is such an interesting conversation because, you know, uh, first it was very funny, nobody <laughs> teed it up, but then, you know, even your colleagues were, were laughing because they kind of recognized what you were saying. You know, so it's like everyone's on the same page, they recognize the same problems, but then, but then something just happens. Uh, and you know, I haven't been here long enough that I haven't had uh, the experience of witnessing, uh, you know, the death by committee to, to know to know what's going on. I mean, there's the old saw that uh, a camel is a, is a horse drawn by a committee, uh, and uh, and so you know, committees can be tricky things. Although in general, I think you know, in a shared governance model, you have to have them, um, and they have to have to get the work done and do the initial uh, vetting. Of a proposal. So. Can I just because that was pretty to kind of follow up on Jordan's uh, sure. comment? Um, what do you think we could learn from um, New Mexico, or what do you think New Mexico as a law school might, might your experience there might uh, benefit? With respect have? to curriculum? Uh, no, just generally, curriculum? too, I think. Yeah, you know, that's such, such an interesting question because I've been thinking about it. I think UNM does a better job of marketing itself. Uh, in Montana. Um, one of the things that really helps UNM is that their clinic um, is consistently ranked in the top 10 in the United States. And um, I don't see any reason, given the strength of Montana's clinic, that it can't also be ranked uh, nationally. And I think that would be a big boost um, to the law school here. So I think uh, while UNM doesn't do a lot of you know, marketing per se, I mean, it's not the brochure kind of thing, but it's that their clinic, uh, their, their clinical professors are very active um, in going out there and kind of letting other professors know what's happening in New Mexico. Because when I look at what happens here, and you know, Montana is amazing because there was required clinic here, you know, when other schools weren't going that way, right? And then at Montana as well, the decision was made to give clinical professors tenure, right? So that should put Montana way ahead of the game. 
Uh, and so I don't know why that recognition hasn't happened. I think that it's a combination of things, but the word just isn't getting out there uh, in part. Because uh, I think that uh, uh, in a lot of ways, the strengths of Montana just aren't known uh, uh, as much as they should be. Okay. Oh, that's how. Okay. Okay. 